So, Brother Tian, if you come up and introduce us, uh, introduce us, yeah, that's what, uh, introduce yourself to all the people watching in YouTube land, and just come up here, just uh, uh, here so they can, they can hear you. So that they can hear me. Amen. Thanks, Brother Bob. Amen. Yeah, good morning. It's nice to meet all you guys. You've been called to the back there, no? <laughs> it's a privilege to be here, and uh, I know uh, my English might not be very familiar to your ears, but I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to help you to understand me. Uh, again, in the interpretation of tongues, I won't do it in Afrikaans, but my name is Tian Gildenes, and uh, I've been in full-time ministry now for 14 years. We got saved, my wife and I, 70, uh, well, yeah, 17 years ago in 1999, and uh, we just started reading the Bible, and I just told Bob yesterday, well, I do have a tie, I'll have it on tonight. So <laughs> we'll still use it. I had to go and buy myself one because in South Africa we don't do the tithing thing anymore. But yes, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we travel quite extensively throughout the world. We minister up in Malawi. I'm going to Malawi next month again. We minister in Zimbabwe. We minister in Namibia, all over South Africa. We've taken a few tour groups to Israel as well. So to us, it's a, it's a privilege to meet new family. I always say to people, you know, we've got a saying in South Africa that you can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your family. So guess what? We are stuck with each other for all eternity. So let's rather start to love each other and get to know each other in eternity. So we love each other with the love of Jesus. So my wife, Joey, is with me. We've been in full-time ministry, as I said, now for 14 years. And it's always nice to just keep on traveling for the Lord. And uh, we go wherever the Lord sends us, and we just do what the Bible says we must do. It's all about doing the word, because that's one thing that the Lord taught me. It's, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? So many people believe, but they don't do. So we started doing, and when we started to do, it started to work. It started to work in our marriage, in our finances, in our children's lives. It's the word of God. It's a living God. It's a living word. It's my privilege to be here. Thanks, Pastor Bob. Do they call you a pastor or a reverend? What do you call pastor. yourself? Pastor. pastor. Is it? Okay. Shepherd. Shepherd. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, pastor is, uh, pastor is uh, Spanish for shepherd. Okay. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. <laughs> so, it's where the word pastor comes from. It means shepherd. And I like that. I don't like, I mean, you could call bishop and things like that. But, of course, bishop has been kind of taken by the Catholics and, and things like that. And, and elder, of course, you've got uh, the, the Mormons like to call themselves elder. I've always been looking for somebody that was a Mormon that had the last name Berry or Flower, because that would just be hilarious. You know, you got Elder Berry and Elder Flower. <laughs> that would just, that'd be just so funny. Many, many years ago, my mom said that we needed to have a Mormon family. Oh, he's a good friend, but... Elder Drinkwater. <laughs> wow. Excellent. <laughs> so, I like pastor, because it just means shepherd, and under shepherd is what in the job entails. Um, amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let's get into our morning service. Oh, no, we can't. We're, we're, 20, we're uh, five minutes ahead of schedule. Um, <laughs> just have to sit there for five minutes till we get a catch up with the schedule. Um, those, what? What's wrong? What's wrong? What? Oh, we'll close down the other one first. Yeah, that's why it won't come up. You have to close that one down because it's already on there. I'll bring that one up. There we go. That's it. Sorted. All these technical difficulties. Anyway, if you were watching online, apparently there was a lot of feedback doing uh, the singing. Is, is, well, we've fixed that now, so we'll, we'll have to cut that out of the... Out of things. So if you're what if you're just if you're tuning in now or if you're watching this on YouTube or the DVDs, you'll understand why um, the singing was cut out because it was uh, it was feedbacked quite a lot, which is a shame. But uh, we've got that sorted now. But anyway, the conference is called to righteousness. It's a called, to, and that's the I prayed about what to call it, and we were praying about what to, to teach on, what to preach on, and these things. And uh, and uh, Tian sent me a list of of sermons that his wife wrote for him. Um, <laughs> and I said, I said, those are great. I said, your one's not so much, but Joey's are excellent. Um, but <laughs> um, and uh, so I was looking, and we and we looked through, and, and um, it just seemed to a call to righteousness, just seemed to be what echoed from the Lord. 
in this because we, 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 and I'm going to get into this in a minute about what righteousness is, but it just seems that so many Christians are consumed in hearing the word as Tian said and not doing the word anymore. And, and just they've got their own interpretations of what the word means. They've got their own interpretation of what God said and what, what God really meant. And I find that so many times you speak to people and I said, this is what the Bible says. I said, well, they say, yes, but, but what did God really mean when he said that? He means what he said. He absolutely means what he said. And, and that's just that's exactly it, that God says what he says. And there's another thing. My phone was on airplane mode and now it's decided to turn back on. Um, so, but, uh, but praise the Lord for that. But God has been good, and I know the devil's been fighting this conference. I mean, with um, Tian's um, accommodation, it was booked in plenty of time, and then uh, somebody knocked on the door and said, we want to buy this place, and we want to move in in two weeks' time. And so, you know, the, the people that owned it sold it to them, and so we're thinking, where, where is he going to stay? And they thought, the Lord's going to provide. And so now it's even better, so the devil tried to shut that one down, or if he did, or maybe it was the Lord sent the person, I don't know. But um, we're going to give all glory to God because where they've put him is just a minute up the road and it's right next to the people that um, are, are own the place. So Lord willing, you'll be able to witness to them. So you pray for them to be saved and, and just thank the Lord for that. Um, you know, so many things. We had a, a blowout on the car coming down yesterday and uh, we were able to fix that and uh, put Tian to work. And, you know, he can change a tire. So if he can change a tire, he can preach the gospel. Amen. Uh, so... <laughs> so because I know a lot of missionaries that I've had come, they just stand and look at it and say, what do you do with that? Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so thank the Lord for his goodness. But again, back to this, it felt the Lord said, call to righteousness. Why are we called to righteousness is what we want to look at. And before we say why are we called to righteousness, let's look at what righteousness is. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, for it's in the name of Jesus that mighty things are done, and through the name of Jesus we have all power and authority to preach this gospel message today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would uh, pour a special blessing upon us. Lord, I pray that each person here would be in the right mind, every person watching would be in the right mind, to receive the things that you have. We pray for anyone watching that does not know Christ as their Savior. Lord, we pray earnestly today that through uh, this conference that they might be saved. We pray for those here today and those watching that, Lord, might not be living a, a godly life. We pray that this might bring them the knowledge that they need uh, to sort their lives out and to, to be pleasing to you. Lord, I know many times we think that we're pleasing you, but, Lord, I pray that you would show us things in our life that are, are not pleasing to you and things that offend you. And, Lord, we might dismiss them from our lives, reject them from our lives, and uh, get back to following you and what you have said in your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would surround this place with holy angels and that the, the blood of Jesus covers each, each one of us here today. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit be upon us to, to take what is said, apply it to hearts, and Lord, speak to each one this morning through the Holy Spirit. Lord, you may speak things that are not even contained in this message. Lord, but we know that you can take scriptures and you can take the words and, and just apply it to each one's heart. We thank you. We pray for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And pray all things to be done this week to honor and glorify your name. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, what is righteousness? Well, the basic definition of righteousness, there's two basic definitions of righteousness I can see in the Word of God. And the first one is that we are righteous in Christ. Those are saved. And when we are saved, we are justified by the righteousness of Christ. That's what I see. So when we talk about being righteous, we talk about being righteous in Christ. That he is righteous. That he is righteous, and because we are saved, we are partakers of his righteousness. And by that righteousness, we will be saved from hell. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, people say to me, said, are we saved? I said, well, what are we saved from? They said, well, we're saved from our sin. I said, well, last time I checked, born again, people could still sin. They said, well, I'm saved from alcohol. I said, well, I said, praise God, you've been delivered from that, but I know Christians that drink alcohol. I know Christians that smoke. So we're not, we're not saved from sin. We're not saved from ourselves. What are we saved from? From hell. We're saved from hell. And we praise God because of the righteousness that is in Christ. Because of his perfect life, he could be the perfect sacrifice. The Bible says that Christ died according to the scriptures. Which scriptures was that? That was the Old Testament scriptures 
that Christ, that God laid down in, in all the works of these things uh, that pertaineth to atonement that Christ was going to do. And he died exactly that way, dying on the Passover day, being buried for unleavened bread and rising on the day of first fruits, exactly as the scripture says, even fulfilling the day of Yom Kippur when he was both goats, the goat for sin and the scapegoat. Hallelujah. And also the high priest that offered himself. Hallelujah. And we praise God. And he sat down at the right hand of God. I had somebody tell me the other day that, that Christ is not sitting down. He is still working. And he is still going into the holy place and applying his blood. I said, whoa, no, 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 no. He said, well, he did that in 1844 or something like that. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I don't believe Hebrews was written in 1845. I said, because my Bible says that Jesus entered once into the holy place and applied his blood, and he sat down on the right hand of God. He finished that work of atonement. Hallelujah. And that is when it was finished. Like I said, it does mean that we have no sin, but are we, free? we are free from the condemnation of hell. Hallelujah. You know, a lot of people today are worried that if they sin or they mess up, they're going to go to hell and they're going to lose their salvation. I tell them, whoa, this is what? your spirit is saved. You're born again of the spirit. The Bible says in, in John that you cannot sin there in the spirit. The spirit cannot sin. And he's talking about being born of the spirit. This flesh is not born again. This flesh is still flesh. We will still sin in this flesh, but our spirit, thank God, our spirit is sealed. It cannot be touched. The devil cannot touch that. Nothing can touch that spirit. Hallelujah. And we know that. And we praise God for that. So what is the, def the second definition of righteousness? Second def definition of righteousness is what we want to talk about in this conference. It's the righteousness in us. Now, if you know any Hebrew, you'll know that the root word for righteousness is tzedak. And there's about five different ways you can say it. Five different ways you can say the word righteousness in Hebrew. And, uh, and, and from that we gather that it means right living. It means rightness. Living right, to be cleansed, to be moral, it means virtue. And when we talk about our righteousness, we talk about what things that we do that are righteous before God. The things that we do according to His Word. Not the things that we say or the things that we hear, but the things that we do. The works that we do must be right. You say, well, I thought we weren't saved by works. No, we're not saved by works. But we keep His commandments because one, we are saved. And two, because we love him. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. People tell me, said, oh, those Old Testament commandments are, are done away with. I said, well, wait a minute. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we say, who is Jesus? And who spoke those commandments? Paul in the New Testament alludes many times to the, the, the commandments. He talks about, as it is written, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. He mentions that in the New Testament. People tell me, if it's not mentioned in the New Testament, it doesn't apply anymore. And I usually say, what about bestiality? Because that's not mentioned in the New Testament. Does that mean it's okay to do that? No. What God said was sin, ten, you know, um, 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. God hasn't changed his mind on what is sin. God does not change his mind and say, that was sin, but now it's okay. God doesn't say, yeah, yeah, no, 3,000 years ago, that was an abomination, but hey, it's okay to do that now. God does not change, the Bible says. So when God says something is sin, he said, that's sin, and that will be sin today, and it will be sin tomorrow. There's no point where God has changed his mind and said, you know what, that was unrighteous then. But it's okay now. Don't find that. When God said, learn not the ways of the heathen, he didn't just speak to the children of Israel. He speaks to us who are adopted into his family to say, hey, still, do not learn the ways of the heathen. We then come on to holiness. I say, what is the definition of holiness? Holiness could be the godly, if we would give our definition, it would be good, the godliest we can be in this life. He said, well, can't we be as holy as we possibly can? Yeah, we can be as holy as we possibly can. But we still have flesh. We will not be perfectly holy 
until we, be, we are exactly like Christ in His presence. If we want to put a small definition on it, it's to be like Christ. We talk about be ye holy, for I am holy. Be that. And holiness is attained through the process of sanctification. Now, a lot of people have problems with this word sanctification because they say, when we're saved, we're sanctified. No, sanctification is a process. It's a process, and it can be a lifelong process. You can be here in 10 years old, or you can be like John and be 120. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's a lifelong process. We attain unto holiness through sanctification. And every day is a process by, why, by which we learn new things. Ten years ago, there's things that I did that now I would never do. Because why? I now have knowledge of those things. And this is where we are to study the Word of God. Somebody had an argument with us about you need to read the Word from Genesis to Revelation, and that's how you are to study the Bible, is read it from Genesis to Revelation. I said, well, hang on, the Bible doesn't say that. It says to study. It says to search. I said, also, how do you know the chronology of, of the way the English Bible is set out? Because it's not the way the Tanakh is set out. In, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, the, 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 the books are in different orders. They're not the same as in English. So what do you do with that? But God says to study, to search. I'm thankful that we have all the books contained to get to, uh, for us today. You know, I am very thankful for the technology that I can just put a word into my computer and search up and find all the words that, 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 that mentions that. I'm very thankful for that. You know, but sometimes we abuse that technology to say, you know, we don't get into our Bibles anymore. We don't just sit and let the Lord show us where to go. Sometimes we, we get into that and we get into that habit. Or we get onto the computer and, and we download, you know, whatever we're going to do for the next year and a half. Right? I know what I'm going to preach and this is, this is how I'm going to do it. Now that's fair enough if you're starting out. Now if you're just starting out, you could say, well, you could learn from these things. But I don't find the apostles went to someone else to download this or had to do that or to find this or... You know, you know, as God said to Moses, basically, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Amen. He said, oh, but Aaron. Said, Don't worry about Aaron. You know what happened when Moses got there? He did all the talking. You know. You find when you let go and let God, because I used to do that. As an independent fundamental Baptist in, in days gone by, you had to have three points in a poem. <laughs> and you had to have the exact uh, time that you did these things. It had to be in this certain way. And all this, and it had to be this, this way. And I started to find that the Holy Spirit, when he started to bring me off of that, I, I would start to fluster because I was going away from my notes. Now people ask me for my notes, and I say, here. Um, <laughs> you already have a copy of my notes, amen. But the Bible tells us about sanctification. If we study the scriptures, we find out what God wants from us. We find out what God expects from us. And, and through, through growth in Christ, through, and Tian shared a, a little bit about his, God's puzzle, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing about as well. He's going to talk about that sometime. And I'm not going to give you anything away here, because it's, 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 that's, that's, that's his thing. But what I'm going to say is this, that through different people, we glean different things. What you may see as sin, this other person over here might not realize that yet. And I know people, when they find out something is sin, they want to attack this person and say, I know it's sin, you need to get rid of that. I say, wait a minute. How long did it take you to figure out that that was sin? How long has God been dealing with you? What things have you learned? What things have you learned that brought you to that point? And that's where we have to think about. We may know and Adam will vehemently say, that is sin. But how long did God spend with us? How long did God spend with us to convict us of these things? Now, I praise God for you, Brother Roddy, that, that God took away the alcohol from you like that. But it was a process when you got saved. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for people that get saved and God just cleans up their life right there and then. I'm very thankful because they're ready to be cleaned up. But some of us are a bit thick-headed. Especially us Scots, Amen. Sometimes it takes a little bit, a bit, a little bit of, of time 
to sink in. You know? Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for us to read the scriptures and it really get down. Because sometimes we're, we're, our culture says, this is okay. Our culture says, this is a bit, but everybody in Scotland does it. Doesn't mean it's right. Sanctification is the process of cleaning up our lives. And ridding our lives of the things, uh, the wicked things that enable us to live righteously. The Bible talks about faithful servants and unfaithful servants. Those faithful servants are living righteously. Why? Because they're doing the things that God wants us to do. And that is what this conference is about. For us to all learn from each other. To learn maybe something that we don't know, something is sin. And one of the lessons this week is going to convict us to say, Wow, I never really saw it like that. I need to put that away from me. And that's what this conference is about. is for us to say, we want to be holy as God is holy. And he calls us to do this. Now let's get to the scriptures. You can see this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says in verse 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, man, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. And, is, and as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Listen to this. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood can not enter the king, inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. You notice what it says? We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The Bible tells us in many instances, especially in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants us to be like Christ. You know, God is the only father that can get away with saying to his children, why can't you be more like your brother? God is the only one that can get away with that. Why can't you be more like your brother? I wonder if Mary ever said that. Hey, Jude, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> but that's what God wants us to, to be like. He wants us to be like Christ. We bear the name Christians. Some of us even bear the actual name Christian. <laughs> but we, we bear the name as Christians. Belonging to Christ. And if we belong to Christ, we should look like Christ. We should act like Christ. And this is very important that we become formed to the image. Not, to, not that we necessarily have to grow a beard and, and walk around in a robe and sandals. If you want to do that, you're, you're welcome to, Brother John. I'm just wondering how that would go down in Falkirk. Um, you know... <laughs> Kind of look at you funny. <laughs> There's that cult leader again. <laughs> but it's who Christ is and what he wants to do in us that we need to be conformed to. If Christ wouldn't do something, then we say, well, why should we do that? If Christ would not go here, we say, why would we go there? I remember having a lady in this church and, and told me her and her husband um, did ministry. And they told me they went into the pubs and they went into the drug dens and they sat down with the people and they said, Christ would have gone into the pubs and he would have gone into the nightclubs to, to reach these people. I said, where do you get that from? He said, well, he ate with sinners. I said, yeah, in their houses. But he did not go into the dens of iniquity. He did not go into the places where all these things were going on. Yes, he went to the houses and ate with sinners, for that's what we are. But when he says, be holy for I am holy, holiness is not going into a nightclub or going into a pub. That is not holiness. For there are only two things that happen in pubs and nightclubs. There's one to get drunk and the other is to get a date. Two things that Christ does not need. And neither does any Christian need these things. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if you know anything about the, the, the way they used to sacrifice in the tabernacle in the temple, you'll understand the principle here that we do not have to bring goats and, and bulls anymore to sacrifice for our sins. Hallelujah. You know, because I love a good steak, but if we still had to sacrifice, there wouldn't be anything left. He says, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So when we presented a dead, when they presented a dead sacrifice to God, it had to be holy. It had to be without blemish, without leaven, which represents sin and false doctrine specifically. But it had to be acceptable to God. If it was not acceptable to God, God would not receive it. So we think we are to present ourselves as a sacrifice, as a free will offering to God. Not that we walk up to the altar and lay on it. If you want to, you can say, here God, here am I. But we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Said said, God, this is the body you have given me. Let me use it as you want me to use it. Let me use it to glorify you. Not to glorify the flesh. Not to glorify the world. But to glorify you. For that is why he's given us this body. And I believe we will be judged on what we've done in our bodies. What we have done to our bodies. How we polluted them. Some of us have. Some of us are working on getting rid of that. Amen. He said it needs to be a living sacrifice. So we need to be alive. We are not dead in trespass and sin. We need to be living for Christ. And we need to be holy, it says, and acceptable to God, unto God. If we're not living a holy life, we cannot present a good sacrifice. We cannot present an acceptable sacrifice if we are full of leaven. But this is only a reasonable service. He says, and, and, and as well, you have to do this, and, he says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You, we have to rethink about things. We have to change the way we think about sin. The things that we did when we were lost or the things that we did back when we were in the world, we now have to change our minds about. We have to say, that was wrong. We have to think differently. God, and this is a prayer that you pray, they say, God, show me sin as you see it. Then sin becomes exceedingly sinful when we're exposed to the law of God. When we see sin the way God sees it, we have to step back and say, wow, he hates that. But yeah, it's something I want to do. Doesn't quite work. Here's a little tip. If the world loves it, probably God hates it. If you see the biggest fad and the world just going nuts over it, you can pretty much guarantee that it's not of God. Whether it's Pokemon, and now there's Pokemon Go stuff. Well, as I just did about, I did three interviews uh, with uh, with a fellow in the States about that, and 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 it is it is rooted in the occult and it is demonic and should not have anything to do with it. I'm not going to spend time on that, but you can listen to the, to the hour and a bit broadcast that we did. We go through all the scriptures, whether it's Harry Potter again rooted in witchcraft, these things. We must examine these things. If the world loves it, chances are just stay away from it. You can study it to find out what is wrong with it. I advise you to do so. Anything that we start to bring in, let's, let's measure it with the word of God to see what it is. That we are not conformed to the world. God said in Leviticus 11.55, he said, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt. Right? He reminds them. That it was him that brought them out of slavery. Christian, I say to you today, remember that it is him that brought you out of slavery. 
It is God that brought you out of bondage to sin. You do not have to be bound by sin in this life. You do not have to be bound by wickedness. You can be set free in Christ. You can live an abundant life. God calls us to live an abundant life. You cannot do that if you're not delivered from the things that hold you bondage to this world and to the devil. He said, because of this, that he brought us up. He said, to be your God. He said, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. He reminds them of this several times. He tells them in Leviticus 19, 2, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. He says, sanctify in Leviticus 27. Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy. Now this tells us exactly what sanctification is. Exactly what sanctification is. He says, sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy. Right? Sanctifying is up to you. It is you that must sanctify yourself. It must be you that makes the decision, say, I don't want this sin anymore. I don't want this bondage anymore. I don't want this dragging me down anymore. I don't want to be like the world. I want to be like Christ. It is you that must make that decision. And I pray over this conference that you make that decision. And that you say, I want to be holy. And I want to do that. But maybe I don't know how to sanctify myself. Maybe I don't know how to do these things. You say, I've heard preaching on being holy. But I don't know how to do this. Well, number one, start listening to the Holy Spirit. But some people can be in so much bondage that they are very hard to hear the Holy Spirit. So first, start getting in the Word of God. Start studying in the Word of God and listen to the messages that are preached during this conference. They will show you how you can clean up your lives. How you can be more like Christ. And this is what this conference is for. Peter said in verse Peter chapter 1 verse 13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Now this doesn't mean not to be drunk. It means to be in your right mind. It means to be thinking clearly without any, um, um, what's the word, um, without any distractions, without any influence. There are many chemicals in this world that influence our mind. Many things that we say are, are okay. And, and by rights, they are legal things, but they are still drugs that influence our mind. Now, we've got to make sure that we are in our right mind, that we are sober, that we're not under the influence of things that may pollute our mind, things that may cause an imbalance in our lives to, to influence us there. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. As obedient children. That is key. Obedient children. Now, my children, when I say something, they don't come back to me and say, well, Dad, what did you really mean? When, when you said don't play on the road, did you really mean don't play in the road or did you just mean don't play when there's cars coming? I said, no. I said, don't play on the road. Amen, children. <laughs> so why do we go back to God when God has commanded something and say, well, how about this? How about we just stretch this a little bit? God said, if I wanted it stretched, I would have said so. We are obedient children doing what he says, not fashioning ourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance. In other words, when you didn't know any better, the things that you did when you didn't know any better. Don't go back to those things. Now you know better. And it, and, it, and, it, and it breaks my heart when I hear about people that knew about paganism or about something that it was in their lives and they got rid of it, but then they've gone back to it. Oh, it breaks my heart because they're not in ignorance any longer. I will, I will say, okay, you are in ignorance of these things. But when we are no longer ignorant, ignorant, it is a grave sin. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, 
Be ye holy, for I am holy. This is the point, again, I'll make this many times. This is the point of this conference. Is that we all go from here holier. We all go from here closer to God. Wanting to do more for God. Striving to, to, and that we will all learn something. We all learn something from this. And that we all grow more and more in the Word of God. But most importantly, that we can see things in our lives that God wants us to get rid of. And see them clearly. And not be bound by the programming that we had back from this church or this pastor or whoever it was. But be free from all of man's programming. And say, God, what have you said in your word? Not what we think he says, but what he says. He tells us again in Deuteronomy 6.25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. The Bible doesn't say and doesn't talk about the ten options. It doesn't say here are ten suggestions. God says here are ten commandments. All right? Ten commandments that we are to observe and to keep. Plus many others that he said, this is what I command you to do. Jesus himself emphasized that, and I've said that again. If you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible says his commandments are not grievous. We always, people today say, oh, these commandments are a yoke of bondage. I say, really? They're a yoke of bondage. Well, how come David said in the Psalms, he that keepeth the law, happy is he? How can you be happy by being under a yoke of bondage? No, my friend, the yoke of bondage is what the world has placed upon you. That is the yoke of bondage, not what God has said. Because God has given us these things to make us free, to keep us from sin, to keep us healthy, to keep us in line with our fellow man. Why does he say, thou shalt not steal? Is that not a good commandment? Why does he say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Is that not a good commandment? People say, oh yes, that's Old Testament. I said, however, Jesus even went one step further and said, if you look with lust, you have committed adultery. So I say unto you, what is harder to keep? The Ten Commandments is they are what Jesus added onto them. Because they're not, now no longer necessarily just physical, they're also spiritual. If we desire to steal from someone, we might as well have stolen it. If we lust after something, we might as well have coveted it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if we lust after it in our heart, we might as well have committed it. Because it's in the mind that sin starts. And if we can desire in our mind, it is sin. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not? You say there's a lot of Bible. Amen. What else do we have? How do we know what righteousness is? How do we know how to live except by the word of God? Amen. Don't, let, don't take my word for it. Listen to what God says. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his, the servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you are servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness and to holiness. God wants us to be servants for him. Servants of righteousness, not servants of unrighteousness. We were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Why should we still live in trespasses and sins. When God has set us free from these things, why do we choose to be in that? When, when someone has saved you out of quicksand, say, or someone has saved you from the tide, from the, 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 if you're drowning in the sea and someone has saved you, why would you jump back in? If someone has pulled you out of the mud or pulled your truck out of the mud because you were stuck, why would you then reverse back into it? Once you are free, you want to stay free. 
And it's the same thing with God. Once we're free, we want to stay free. Why do we go back into the world? Why do we want to yield to the temptations the devil has? Because he knows we still have flesh. We still have this carnal mind, but we also can tap into the mind of Christ. But the problem comes when we're double-minded. When the one mind, that fleshly mind, says you want to do one thing, and the mind of Christ says you want to do something else, you become torn. And you become double-minded, and you become unstable in all your ways. Well, he tells us to have the mind of Christ. Arm ourselves, he says, arm yourselves with the mind of Christ. Why? Because it is armor. If you think like Christ, you will do like Christ. If you see things the way Christ sees it, you will not entertain that sin. You will say, no, because Christ does, will not do that. And Christ does not want me to do that. Amen. I'm going to skip that just now. And 2 Corinthians says, Be ye not unequally yoked, in chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. Be not unequally yoked. If you know anything about old time farming, you'll know what a yoke is. And a yoke is where you put two beasts together and you, you fasten them together and they will, it's what will pull your wagon or what will plow your field. God tells us in the Old Testament not to plow with an ox and an ass together. Why? Because one is stubborn and one is very strong. So if you're trying to, to pull the two, one is this height and the other one's this height, this one can't pull as strong as this one. And this one might have his own mind and might want to go over here. It doesn't work. It's, it makes sense to plow with two oxen, not an ox and an ass, because you're going to go here or there and everywhere. That's why he says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. He sees, takes that physical law and shows us a spiritual application by it and says, just like you're not to plow with an ox and an ass, same way you're not to be yoked with unbelievers. Why? Because they have their own direction. As a believer, you have a direction to go in, which is to serve Christ. But if you are yoked with an unbeliever, or even somebody that is saved, but does not believe the way you believe, perhaps you say, well, I want to serve God the way He wants me to serve Him. But the one that you're yoked to says, well, I just don't see it that way. How can you walk together when you're not agreed? How can one say, I want to get out of pagan ways, but the other one says, mm, no, we've always been doing this, and you know, my, my family won't understand if I don't come out of this. He says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? It doesn't mix. Light and dark don't mix. They can't mix together. And what concord, and if you study out that word con concord, it has the application of, of symphony, of music. In other words, how can we be in harmony with, with Christ, but also with Belial? How can we mix the music of the world with the music of God? Many people today do that. I remember when I was in university, Somebody was handing out um, gospel CDs. Well, they called them Christian music. And it was Christian heavy metal music. And I said, oh, like iron sharpeneth iron, because that's a heavy metal. And uh, they didn't get it either. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> they said, no, 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 heavy metal music. You know, that. I said, as only when they scream into the microphone, you can't understand what they're saying. But yeah, but it's, it's all of the lyrics are all about Jesus. I said, can you understand the lyrics? No, but you can read them in the, in the CD, and, it, and it's all about Jesus. I said, well, what would you do with that? They said, well, we give it to those people that are into heavy metal music. And by listening to that, they might come to Christ. 
I said, okay. I said, do you believe that that's what Christ would want you to listen to? Well, no. But once they get saved, we'll tell them that it's wrong. What? How does that work? I will win you to Christ with sin, but after I win you, I will tell you that what I won you to Christ with is sin, and you must stop doing that. That made no sense to me whatsoever. What concord at Christ with Belial? I said, how can you take the devil's music and say, oh, this is God? How can we glorify Christ with the music of the devil? You can. When we see music, and, and you all know that we're, we, our family is really into music, into instruments and things. And even, even in the tuning of our guitars and our instruments, we tune them back to God's original frequency of 432 hertz, not the world's tuning of 440. Because the Nazis came up with 440 tuning. But we tune them, you say, well, I don't understand all that. That's not a problem. But we hear the difference. And I feel the difference in the music, going back to what God did it. And you can study it and you can see the phenomenal differences between these frequencies. And you can say, I see what you mean when you say what, what concord of Christ with Belial. These things don't mix. These things don't mix. You have discord. You have, you just, it, oh, it sounds it's screeching. It doesn't work. And what agreement have you that are the temple of God with that of idols? What do we have? He said, and I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they shall be my people. Then he says, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. People say, oh, there's no unclean things in the New Testament. Apparently there are. Touch not the unclean thing, he said, and I will receive you and I will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God says, come out from among them. Come out of the world. The things, just because you are doing it and all your Christian friends are doing it doesn't mean to say it's right. God says, come out from among them. Come out of Babylon. Come out of the world. Come out of uncleanness. Come out of bondage and serve God in the way He wants you to serve Him. You know, we saw, we see uh, pictures that says, you worship God your way and I'll worship God the way He tells me to. That's what God wants us to do. And he gives us plenty of scriptures to tell us how to do that. But maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, why well, this doesn't make any sense to me? I ask you, are you saved? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because you can't even begin to be holy if you do not have Christ. If you have never been saved, you cannot begin to be holy. You say, well, I've got a problem with drink. I've got a problem with drugs. I've got a problem with cigarettes or whatever it may be. And, and I want Christ to help me. First of all, you've got to be saved. You've got to snap that bondage, first of all. You've got to have the authority in your life that can, can declare to Satan that he is a defeated foe. And until you are saved, you cannot say that. You say, how do I know that I can be saved? It was very simple. We look at the Word of God and we see that each one has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can look down through His laws and say, this is sin, and this is sin, and this is sin. If we've lied, stolen, committed adultery in our heart, looked with lust, any of these things, we know that we have, we have sinned against Almighty God. And God, there is a place called hell that God never intended you to go to. It was created for the devil and his angels. He never intended. People say, why would God create hell? He didn't create it for you. He created it for the devil and his angels. God never intended you to go to hell. But the, most, the best question is, what did God do so that you didn't have to go to hell? Not why would God create hell. Don't even worry about that. The question is, what did God do so that you don't have to go there? And that is he sent his son, Jesus Christ. To be born of a virgin. To be born at the appointed time, as God said. Now, we don't know when that was. But he says, to be born at this appointed time, when the fullness of time has come, right there at that proper time. To what? To live a righteous and holy life. That he might be the perfect and, and acceptable sacrifice, once and for all, for our sin. That he could pay the sin debt that we owe. And that we need to accept 
his free gift and say, I want this free gift. We need to stand in repentance and say, I don't want this sinful life anymore. I don't want to be like the world. And repent, tell God that you're sorry for what you've done and say, God, forgive me. Turn around from that. Trust Christ today and you can be saved. I'm not going to give you a prayer that you say because if you're truly sorry with God, if you're truly wanting to turn around, you will figure out the words to say. I've never believed in say, say this prayer. You know, I don't tell my kids when they've come and they've done something wrong. I said, right, go away and rehearse this. Say, well, Daddy, I'm sorry that I've sinned and, and I'm, I'm really sorry for what I've done. I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, I mean, you know, they don't do that. If they've done something wrong, they're able to come and they have the words to say. You think back about when you did something wrong and you had to apologize. You didn't have to download a script and say, this is how I apologize. We go to God with a, a, a repentant heart. Say, God, forgive me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you do as the Bible says, I can guarantee that you will be saved. And then you can start your holy life. You can start having that knowledge. But if you're not saved and you're watching this or if you're here, if you're not saved, I urge you to think about these things and speak to us and we can show you how you can be saved. Well, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you lived a righteous life, that we can look at your life and want to be like you, to walk like you, to talk like you, and, and to be conformed to the image of Christ. I pray today for anyone that is unsaved, or anyone that does not know Christ as the Lord and Savior, I pray earnestly that they would they have a desire in their heart to be, uh, be saved and become like Christ. I pray for, pray for those here today Lord, that you might be speaking to the, their heart about something that needs to be given up. I pray you would work on each one of our hearts, Lord, myself included, that you would search our hearts and try our ways to see if they're pleasing and acceptable to you. God, bless now this invitation and all that come, that it might be done so according to your perfect will. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to come this morning, if you want to come pray, that you can come pray. If you want to grab somebody to pray with you, um, and, and ask them questions, feel free to do so.
Brother John Kerr, will you dismiss us in prayer? Yes, good. Yes. 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 Amen. 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 You're just can be seated and you're dismissed. Amen.